You can take out your Bibles this morning and turn to the doctrine of repentance. (laughs) That's what we'll be talking about this morning. Let me pray for us as we get started. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us uh, when we think about, uh, again, just what we deserve and what you have given us instead. Now, we join all of humanity in recognizing your good gifts to those who love you and those who do not. And we have much to give you thanks for. And our lives began in rebellion against you and slavery to sin and in godlessness. And in the gospel, you have brought us to yourself through Christ. And you have given us as a gift, faith, and as another gift, repentance. And these are entrance points for us into a life of faith and repentance that continues. We ask, oh God, that you would help us to understand what repentance is and then practically how to apply this. And we ask for your help in it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the topic for this morning's equipping hour is repentance. I'll give you a definition of the word right out of the gate. Repentance is a change of mind with an appropriate change of behavior. A change of mind leading to a change of behavior. Uh, That is what the word means. That is uh, how it unfolds for us in scripture. And it is the the fundamental entrance point into the Christian life. To to turn from gods that are no gods to the one true and living God is the way Paul describes salvation in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. It is a turning from one thing and a turning to another, a 180 degree shift in perspective along with a 180 degree shift in life. It is not just a mental ascent to something. Oh, that's wrong. That's right. But an actual living in what is right as opposed to what is wrong. Repentance is the flip side of faith. Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. To go from not believing God to believing God, uh, to turn from things that displease God to things that please Him, are the two sides of this thing called uh, faith and repentance that God gives at salvation. I spent a number of years in a, a theological school that taught that repentance has nothing to do with salvation. Uh, that was not a good view, it was not particularly helpful. Repentance is, in fact, the, the beginning from the human side of what salvation is. Uh, turning from yourself and Satan and the world and sin unto God. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 statements to the castle church at Wittenberg in 1517, beginning the Protestant Reformation, the very first one he listed was a statement about repentance Whether or not Luther was a believer at that time, he recognized that repentance was to be a mark of the entirety of the Christian life. And he's right. We discover as we walk through scripture that though we have been saved into a new identity, a new life, and a new relationship with Christ, new desires, new character, a new creation, we still battle residual depravity. The, the hangover, if you will, of our life apart from Christ. We fight sin. In fact, a believer has the capacity to fight sin in ways that an unbeliever doesn't. A believer has a war internally. As we talk about repentance in the Christian life, I want us to remember that recognizing sin is not the same thing as repentance. Repentance. When you recognize sin, you feel conviction about sin, or somebody points out sin, or you read a Bible verse and realize, oh, God says something against what I've been doing. I recognize it. Sometimes we can have the cathartic effect of feeling like, oh, I saw it. Okay, I'm good. Don't stop there. Recognition is not repentance. And then confession is not repentance. We, we might recognize that something is sin, and then we might even confess that it is sin. To confess is simply to speak with, speak alongside of, or to agree with God. God says it's sin. I confess that it is sin. 
That means I agree with God's assessment of it, and I agree with his seeing me having sinned. God, you know, and I know that I sinned. I speak with you in that. That is confession. But confession is not repentance. Don't stop at recognition of sin. Don't stop at confession of sin. We must move to a turning from sin. Uh, the repentance, uh, which also includes a replacement that is a, an undoing of bad behavior and a replacing it with good behavior. The New Testament vocabulary of, of putting off something like taking off an old uh, garment and putting on something new. So we don't confuse these things. We don't stop at recognition of sin. We don't stop at confession of sin. Repentance and replacement are critical. Now, what I want to do this morning is, is I hope, be very practical with you. I want to give you a template sort of a, a personal worksheet for turning from sin, uh, a personal repentance worksheet. The, this is a series of four questions that I ask of my own heart when I recognize sin. I, I see that there's sin. I got caught. Uh, I felt conviction. Somebody pointed something out to me. Uh, I read a Bible verse and realized something I had just been very comfortable with is actually displeasing to the Lord. There is some recognition of a sin in my life, and my heart. And so this template is a series of four questions that I ask myself that you can ask yourself and answer with a soft heart, an expectant prayer, and an open Bible as an avenue for fighting sin. It's not the only way to go about this. I'm, again, this sort of series we're doing in Equipping Hour is my own personal biblical counseling. To me, you are an audience for it. So I'm sharing with you what I do when I recognize sin in my life. So these, these four questions we'll get to, I'll just give them to you up front. What does God call my sin? How does God feel about my sin? What did God do about my sin? And what must I do about my sin? We'll go through these several times through the course of this next hour. Let's start with that first question. What does God call my sin? And you might think, well, what kind of a silly question is that? Um, I just recognized it. I know what it is. And what I need to encourage my own heart is to allow God's word to inform my vocabulary about my sin the descriptions about my sin. I need God's perspective on this. I am so prone to give myself the benefit of the doubt, get myself off the hook, give myself the easy path, not call things what they are, and not dig up all the dirt I need to dig up on the condition of my own heart. So if I open my Bible with an expectant prayer heart, with a, a softness ready to turn, I will find that there is much more to my sin than I initially thought. I have a picture for you on the, on the screen of a tree. Now this tree has fruits on it. I don't know what kind of fruits those are. It's too far away. But the fruits are attached to, to the outer stems on the branches of, these tree, of this tree. And, and those outer stems are attached to bigger branches and bigger branches and then to the trunk and that trunk goes down into the ground where you see the roots, and the roots are embedded in soil. Well, think about each of these elements for a moment, and, and think about how they relate to our sin. So often when we notice a sin in our lives, we notice it as a piece of fruit, a piece of bad fruit. Oh, there's a bad fruit on here. Uh, there's a piece of fruit with a bad spot. I got to get rid of that. And so we pull it off the tree, and we throw it away. And if we carry out this metaphor a little bit, you, maybe you feel a little regret about having thrown it away and say, oh, maybe it's not that bad. Um, like a pig returning, dog returning to its vomit and a pig returning to the mud. You, you, you pick up that uh, sin fruit and you go, well, I mean, I'm going to kind of miss it if I throw it all the way away. And of course, that, that half-hearted repentance is not what pleases the Lord. If it's a, a fruit and a bad fruit and a, a damaging fruit, a fruit that is noxious and would cause sickness and ongoing consequences, let's be rid of that thing. And so often we, we look only at the piece of fruit and we're not done, not nearly done. Sin is rarely alone. Sin loves 
conspirators. Sin loves company. Sin loves friends. And, and often sins go together. And so when I think about doing battle with sin in my life, I, I don't want to stop short at, at seeing one obvious outward activity and think, oh, that's sin. I'm, I must be rid of that. Um, let's trace out that sin. What is it connected to? What, what branch is that piece of bad fruit on? Are there other related sins on that branch? And, and what is causing this bad fruit? What is coursing through the, the veins and capillaries of the tree uh, that is producing this bad fruit? And, and what trunk is it connected to? And this trunk has sunk roots deep into the ground. What are those roots? Can we dig those up and and find what's in there that's causing bad fruit? And then finally, what soil is this tree planted in? We don't go near far enough when we examine a bad piece of fruit and chuck it. So we want to see other related sins. Some biblical counselors will talk about this as expanding our confession list. There is a presenting sin, a presenting problem. I I got caught or I was convicted or I I noticed some blemish in my life and and I want to be rid of it and I I don't want to face the consequences of it. And what can I do uh, quick and dirty just to get rid of this thing? And a good biblical counselor is going to say, wait, let's slow down. Um, Losing your temper is seldom sitting out there all by itself. There are branches we need to examine. There is a trunk we need to look at, roots we need to see, and soil we need to do some experimentation and and scientific examination of. And if we step out of the metaphor for a minute, what, what are we after in these branches and trunk and roots and soil? Well, really what we're, what we're going after here are Related sins, that's other fruits. Motives of the heart, what are the internal desires that are driving sinful activities? We might think of those as the branches in the trunk. Idols of the heart, what am I worshiping that motivate bad behavior? We might think of those as the roots. And then the soil we would call unbelief. And at that word, you, that might be a jarring word when you think of, oh, no, I'm a believer. What do you mean unbelief? We're going to talk about a practical atheism that shows up in the life of a believer. It doesn't characterize the life of a believer, but shows up as part of the residual depravity in the life of a believer. When you and I sin, there is always a fundamental failure of theology, of belief. No matter what our creed is, there's something we're not believing rightly about God. And so we need to... Dig up the soil, examine the roots, look at the trunk, see the branches, perhaps pick off other fruit. So when I ask this first question, what does God call my sin? We we need to have in our mind this picture of a tree and and we think about the other related sins. And and if we don't do this, if we don't expand the confession list and and dig a little bit deeper, it's kind of like trying to get rid of dandelions with a lawnmower. Have you tried that? And especially after the dandelions have gone to harvest or whatever you call the fluffy white segment of a dandelion's life. And, And the mower chops it all off and makes the green stems even with the green grass and it all looks great for about a day and a half. But you've just spread the seeds for more corruption through the rest of your yard. And soon you will have nothing but a dandelion field. That is no way to fight sin with any lasting fruit. When we think about the motives of the heart, we move from the the fruit to the, the branches and these motives of the heart. These are the desires that drive behavior. And it is appropriate for us to recognize and confess and turn from and replace errant desires. There is a a movement today that says, well, the desires are untouchable. You you really just have to worry about the behavior. This is prominent in the the field of thinking about the relationship of homosexuality to Christianity. Uh, You can be a homosexual but never act on it because the desires aren't sinful, only the acting. That is not the biblical view. The biblical view is errant desires are themselves sinful. And that's appropriate for us to remember. God, I feel indifferent toward you today. Well, 
confess it, recognize it, turn from it, and replace it. Those feelings will produce activities. You're, You're not off the hook because you haven't acted out on them. This is why Jesus defines lust as adultery. This is why coveting is on the same level, Old Testament and New Testament, with stealing. And why coveting itself and greed are called idolatry. Because the heart motives underneath, which drive the behaviors on the outward side of things, are just as offensive to the Lord as the outward behavior. They must be addressed. They will produce more fruits, and they are themselves wrong. So we confess errant emotions, spiritual dryness, lethargy, apathy, resentment. And we don't sugarcoat our confessions by saying what you know we should say. I don't, I don't know if you do this. It, it, you see a sin and, and all of a sudden the, the recognition of a sin makes you think, ooh, I have to be better. Uh, I'm not losing my temper now. God, I didn't mean to be angry. That, that's sort of a cheap confession. I, I didn't want to be greedy. I, I didn't want to speak unkindly. It just sort of fell out. Actually, we need to confess the desire. I, I, I lost my temper because I was angry. I, I wanted to speak unkindly, and that's why I did it. Out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Don't cheap at the con- cheapen the confession. Uh, we don't uh, paint over it white, uh, with white paint, making it less than it was. To confess is to, again, to speak with or to agree with God about the reality that God already knows. The reality of our hearts is that we follow our desires. So confess the errant desires. Confess that you wanted to do X, Y, Z. You actually did X, Y, Z. And both the wanting and the doing are an offense. And we move from there, from the outward behaviors, down through the motives, into the idolatries. Uh, You know that an idol is the worship of anything other than the one true God. And and we often think about uh, ancient civilizations carving sticks and rocks and and, and bowing down to them and offering food that never gets eaten. They have to throw out the food and offer a new plate of food the next day. Of course, the idol doesn't see or hear or eat or do anything. It's, It's a big nothing. And, and behind all of that physical idolatry is truly the worship of self in the Old Testament. Behind the worship of Molech or Asherah or any of those things was, well, if I do this thing for this idol, I get good crops. I get uh, fertility. I get uh, all the things I ever wanted. I get prosperity. It is, in the end, a worship of self. And, and that is what idolatry is. It is a dethroning of God. It is an enthroning of self. And using whatever means of, of religion or ceremony or hard work or, or sacrificing anything else for the sake of worshiping me. That, that's at the center and the heart of idolatry. And so we have to trace out the idolatrous roots of our sins. And a great question to ask yourself is, what am I loving right now that I'm not getting? What is it that I want that I don't have? The, the, the space between there is, is a good indication of what the idolatry is. Is it is it an idolatry of safety? Is it an idolatry of comfort? The esteem of others? Is it the idolatry of pleasure? Is it the idolatry of, of relationships? The satisfaction that comes from any of those things? And so we begin to examine through the window of our unhappiness, impatience, ingratitude, complaining, controlling, lying, cheating, stealing, killing, Uh, What what do those outward sins reveal about the idols in my heart? We need to dig those up. It's not enough to say, I lost my temper. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. (laughs) Without digging up, what is it that I'm in love with that I'm not getting? What is it that's more important to me now than the glory of God? What are my idols underlying this sin? And then we think about the soil, that is the, the soil in which the tree is growing, sort of, sort of the uh, environment in which this bad fruit is being cultivated. And this is the realm of belief and unbelief. And unbelief would be areas like unsound theology. In other words, my, my view of God is not what it should be. It, it comes up short, it's, it's errant, it's not healthy. 
Everybody's a theologian. The question is, are you a good one? Does your theology align with God's self-disclosure in his word? Is our view of God in keeping with the reality of God? And so our diseased theology can result in idolatrous roots leading to foul motives producing unhealthy fruit, bad behavior. Also, incomplete theology hurts us here. We're all growing. None of us knows all the answers. There are gaps in what we know about God. In fact, we'll forever be learning about who God is, trying to squeeze the infinite God of the universe into our finite puny brains forever and ever and ever. It's why heaven won't be boring. And in this life, certainly we are crippled by our finitude. And we might say our sinitude. <laughs> We, we're, we, we don't see things right because of residual sin in us, and we don't see everything because we're finite in our abilities. And so we need to grow. Keep reading your Bible. Keep learning about God. You can trace sin to theology. There's something about God I need to believe better than I am. There's, there's something true about God that I'm not believing in this moment. We can also describe this soil of unbelief as unapplied theology. There are things I know that I'm going to disregard for the moment because I feel like complaining. I know God is good. It's in our doctrinal statement. But I just want to, I just really want to revel in the idea that God's good goodness is not true for me right now because I'm not getting what I want. And it is a denial of the theology we know, profess, believe, disciple others in, in a moment where we are resenting God. There's also the category of convenient theology. Maybe something true enough about God. God wants me to be happy. Does God want you to be happy? Yes, God wants you to be happy. Read the the happy attitudes, Matthew 5. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Look at the word blessed through all of the Psalms. There is happiness all over the Bible. God has designed you for it in him. That's a truth that gets mangled when we say, well, God just wants me to be happy. I'm not happy in this marriage. Therefore, God wants me to divorce and try again. That is sort of convenient theology, a a twisting, a mangling of, of some kernel of truth so that I can worship the idol I really want, be motivated by the things I want to be motivated by, and produce the behavior that God despises. When we think about the soil of unbelief, it boils down to not believing something about God, about his character, or perhaps not believing something about his promises. At my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611. Do you believe that? That, That's not all found here. There there is a waiting and anticipation of the things God has promised. But but do you believe him for those promises? Fear and anxiety. Um, Do you believe God's promises to give you everything you need when you need it? No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. He, He cares for the sparrows. Not one drops to the ground without his care. And he loves you far more. Do you believe these things? Do you believe God's promises for no separation and no condemnation? I feel condemned. This is where we overrule our emotions. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago with truths from God's word. There's, there's something I'm not believing about God's promises. Or there's something we're not believing about God's warnings. Warnings of coming judgment. Warnings of consequences for sin. Uh, God is not mocked. You reap what you sow. James tells us why. I'm not going to take that very seriously. I I think I can just continue in this sin and and then I'll confess and I'll be fine. Well, God's not mocked. And we short his warnings through unbelief. So that all falls under this first question. What does God call my sin? And, And we'll put some practical labels on this in a few moments. The second question, the template to work through is how does God feel about my sin? How does God feel about my sin? And it is right for us to think this way. We come to scripture and we say, how how does God respond 
to his image bearers whom he created and sustains and lavishly gives and gives and gives and gives sunshine and rain and all kinds of blessings to over and over and over. And they live in antipathy and unbelief. They don't even acknowledge him. They're not grateful. They take his gifts and pervert them. How does God feel about this? Psalm 5 tells us that God is angry with the wicked every day. Romans 1.18 tells us that the wrath of God is being revealed in an ongoing way against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And Jesus said in John 3.36, if you don't believe in the Son, the wrath of God abides on you. How does God feel about sin? Well, as it relates to the sin in the world, uh, God hates it. Um, his wrath abides over it in some ways is being revealed against it. And in, according to Romans 2, his full wrath against sin is being stored up for the day of his wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed through the judgment of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a day coming when the dam of God's mercy holding back much of that wrath will break out on rebellious humanity. God hates sin. And we're confused about this sometimes because people who sin boldly and recklessly and continuously aren't struck by lightning. They don't die on a spot. Uh, they're not all wiped out in a flood. And all of humanity changes its tune. Well, most were wiped out in a flood and humanity hasn't changed its tune. But most of human history means there is a waiting for the justice of God. And the world doesn't see it. That does not negate how God feels about sin. And then when you think about the doctrine of eternal punishment, this just ramps up to eternal proportions, doesn't it? That God's good, holy, just, beautiful love of everything that is good has a corollary. His infinite, beautiful, just good hatred of everything that is contrary. And this is serious. How does God feel about sin? Uh, well, he was willing to wipe out almost the entire human race in a flood. He'll bring a temporal judgment again on the earth through fire. And then there is the great white throne judgment leading to the lake of fire for all of eternity. For those who don't turn to him in faith, God hates sin. Question number three, what did God do about my sin? So this is a, a look back to a past tense reality. I, I'm asking the question as I'm thinking about my sin, just discovered, uh, what does God call it? How does God feel about it? And now, what did God do about it? And, and what is the answer to that question? Substitutionary atonement. God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in my place to the cross on Calvary outside of Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago to die the death that I deserved. He was my substitute and he atoned. He, he made the two parties at one. Atone is an English word just built from at and one. Atonement, at one meant. That's where we get the word. And the idea is there is a reconciliation or a unification of Parties that are at enmity with one another. They are opposed. They're at war. And they are brought together by something. They are made at one. And, and sinners are made one in relationship to God by substitution. By the substituting of Jesus the righteous in the place of me, the sinner. This isn't just abstract theological textbook. Jesus died on the cross for sins. No, this is... Jesus died on the cross for my sin. This is personal. This is a, a one for one correspondence between my crimes and his punishment. And faith in the finished work of Christ is the foundation for the Christian life. You're not a Christian without this personal trust in, adherence to, belief in, white knuckle grip on the finished cross work of Christ which was stamped with the approval of resurrection, which means that as he died in the place of sinners, his sacrifice was accepted before his father 
And he didn't have to stay in the grave as one bearing the weight of sin. He conquered it, defeated it. His infinite person was big enough to wipe out an infinite debt before an infinitely holy God. And when Jesus cried out on the cross, to Telestai, or it is finished, he means done. Now, what does this bring about for all who believe? Adoption in love. God, in his love, looked at you at your worst, Romans 5. While we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. And in pity and in mercy and in love, he brought you into his family. It means not just adoption, but reconciliation. That is the cessation of hostilities. It means justification. That is a judicial declaration of righteousness. In a court of heaven, God is willing to say, that sinner forgiven has never done anything wrong, and he's always done everything right. You can think about justification this way. Just as if I'd never sinned. Sort of sounds like justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. That is the legal courtroom declaration of the gospel. This is um, such a remarkable thing. God gives us new life, life in him and life with him because he took us out of our sin dead state and regenerated us so that we would believe and repent. Belief and repentance are both gifts by grace, Ephesians 2. These are all of God given to us as a free gift so that we might be in him. This is the gospel. J.I. Packer famously in his book, Knowing God, summarized the gospel in three words. I love this definition. I think about this when I'm trying to explain the gospel to somebody else. Three words. I can remember three words. They're hard ones. Adoption through propitiation. That means I'm brought into God's family by his love, adoption, through, what is the vehicle for adoption? Propitiation. That is, God satisfied his own wrath against my sin by a substitute sacrifice in my place. Satisfaction of divine wrath by a substitute. That's propitiation. So we have adoption through propitiation. This is good news. And what do I need to do when I discover some new sin or some old sin in my life? Well, I want to call it what God calls it. I want to remember how God feels about it. And I really need to get to question three. (laughs) What did God do about it? I need to remember and rehearse the good news. And not in an impersonal way. I I insert name, insert sin. (laughs) I think about my sin for me, paid for by my Savior. Fourth question. What must I do about my sin? What does God call my sin? How does he feel about my sin? What did he do about my sin? And then fourthly, what must I do about my sin? Again, it's not enough to recognize it. It's not enough to agree with God that it's there. Um, But there must be a turning, a repentance, and a replacement. And I want you to see this. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. In this turning, which is a, hey, I I really liked this this fruit. It was bad, and I was eating it because I liked it. I'm confessing the fact that I liked it. Now I'm confessing the fact that my... Desires were errant and they stemmed from wrong motivations. It produced these activities that were awful and they came out of an idolatrous heart rooted in unbelief. So now what? I'm going to go to an objective reality first. This is Ephesians 4. Look at verse 20. After describing a a vice list, uh, sins that are displeasing to the Lord. Paul tells the Ephesians, you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you heard him and were taught him him, just as truth is in Jesus. Uh, How were the Ephesians taught Christ by Paul? They were taught to lay aside the old man, which was being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. 
They were taught to go on being renewed in the spirit of the mind. And they were taught to put on the new man. And this old man, new man language shows up in texts in the New Testament related to a once for all objective event, a grace reality, whereby the paleos anthropos, the old man, that's not a title for your dad. Uh, that, that's who you were before you knew Christ. You put him off. You did. That, that's how you were taught coming into Christ. And you have put on the new man. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. These are objective grace realities that happened at the point of conversion. And what's sandwiched in between verse 22 and 24, and the verb tenses are important here, is a present ongoing reality of being renewed in the spirit of your mind. So you put off the old man, past tense. You put on the new man. Now you're a new creation. And in an ongoing way in the Christian life, you'd be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There is a recalibration, a rethink of everything. We need our Bibles. We need God's word. We need to think God's thoughts after him. And we need to progressively flush old ways of thinking and replace them with new. But Ephesians 4 doesn't stop with those objective gospel realities in past tense. Uh, This becomes the basis for new behavior. Look at verse 25. Therefore, so bundling up these grace realities, old man's dead, gone. New man's here. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. It's the word for taking off clothes and, and putting them down. Take them off and put it away. Falsehood. And, and in their place, put on something else. Speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. Be angry, probably a concession. Don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Look at verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer. Okay, that's, not the, that's not the end of a, of a mind renewal sort of repentance. How do you stop stealing? When does a thief stop being a thief? When he stops taking stuff. No, not quite. Uh, look at verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. When does a thief stop being a thief? Um, recognize old man's dead, new man's here. Renew your mind about all of this. Stop stealing, yes, but go to work and work double and give stuff away. This is a a total rethink leading to a totally new way of life. The parallel in Colossians is similar. There's an objective reality in Colossians 3 that is the basis for a sort of put off, put on new way of living. Look at Colossians 3, 9, right in the middle of the verse. You put off, that is past tense, you did it. You did put off the old man with its evil practices and you have put on the new man who is being renewed to a full knowledge. There you see the same pattern. Two objective realities. You put off the the old man. You did put on the new man. And there's this ongoing mind renewal that is then going to produce different behavior. Look at verse 8. Now you also lay these all aside. Wrath, anger, malice, slander, abusive speech. Don't lie to one another. Since you did put off the old man and you have put on the new man, that new man is being renewed to full knowledge. So as the elect of God, verse 12, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, graciously forgiving one another, put on love and unity. All of these things are the replacement behaviors for the vice lists that went before. That's why it's not enough to look at the bad fruit and just go, oh yeah, that's bad. See what God says about it. Begin to appropriate what God feels about it. Remember what God did about it. And then there are things you must do about your sin. And some of that doing means not just putting away the bad behaviors, but replacing them with new. Not just putting away the the bad motives, but replacing them with new. Not just putting away the idols, but replacing the loyalties with wholehearted worship of God. Not just putting away the unbelief, but filling your mind with faith, faith specifically in what God has revealed, believing the truth 
of God's word related to God, yourself, sin. In all of this, we are to replace these areas of unbelief with the kind of dependent childlike trust that says instinctively, my God knows what is best. I will believe his goodness. I will believe his wisdom. I will believe his power. I will believe his promises. I will believe his warnings. My encouragement in this template is to employ specific passages of Scripture in these four questions. Now, I want to walk back through these four questions with an example. Uh, this is an example I've used before, but let's just say the, the presenting sin is the sin of stealing a pack of gum from the Circle K. Is that a sin? Can we all agree? Shouldn't do that. It's bad. That's a, a bad fruit hanging on the tree. And, and let's go back to the tree picture. So here it is. Um, you look at one of those little fruits on the tree and you go, ah, oh, stole a pack of gum from the Circle K. Shouldn't have done that. Um, the, the cameras caught me. The police officer's outside uh, and says, uh, you want to empty your pockets, young man? Or maybe I just felt guilty about it walking away. Maybe... As I'm chewing the gum, it loses its flavor almost instantaneously because of a burdened conscience. The telltale heart starts beating. And, Whoa, I blew it again. What is the crime? Well, I stole a pack of gum from the Circle K. Well, let's not stop there. Um, let's look at the related fruits and the branches and the trunk and the roots and the soil. Now, let's just walk through this exercise uh, with this example for a moment. Of course, what do we call that sin according to the Bible? Uh, it is theft. Exodus 20, do not steal. We just read it in Ephesians 5 as well, don't steal. And what's underneath the theft? Well, what is the heart motive underneath that? What do we call it? Greed, coveting, thou shalt not covet. By the way, any idea that the Mosaic law only dealt with outward behaviors and not the heart missed the Ten Commandments. <laughs> The whole table ends with this whole heart issue of coveting other people's stuff. Don't steal. Don't covet. Those are both there. Greed, uh, another motive. I, I want something. I want more. Coveting is I want something that belongs somebody, to somebody else. Greed is I just want more. And Colossians calls greed idolatry. What's the connection? This love of more, this want of more especially as it transgresses God's law, is a valuing of that more of something higher than God himself. I want something more than I want God. I love something else more than I love God. What else is involved in this sin of stealing a pack of gum? Probably lying, deception of some sort. Um, you probably didn't just walk up to the clerk Show it, walk out the door. I mean, maybe if you're in San Francisco, you do that. <clears throat> All the stores are closing, by the way. Um, but in a normal world, you have to kind of hide it. And so there's a lying and the deception there. Perhaps the thrill of illicit behavior is involved in the sin. That's an interesting motive. Uh, there's an excitement. It, it runs up and down my spine that I kind of get away with something I shouldn't be doing. And, and at the bottom of that, the, the, the sin, the, what the Bible would call it is, they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This thrill-seeking, especially a transgressive thrill-seeking, is I've elevated instantaneous pleasure over obedience to God. Embedded in this sin is a lack of love, a, a failure of selfless love for others. Whom should I have loved in this instance? I, I should have loved the clerk at the Circle K who has to put food on the table. I, I, should, have, I should have loved the, the others involved in Circle K management and Circle K corporate. And then the whole supply chain of Wrigley, all the way to the Wrigley building and Wrigley Field in Chicago, Wrigley corporate and the Wrigley family and the inheritance. Listen, they, they built and earned all of that stuff and I, and I decide that, that they don't deserve it, I deserve it. It's, it's theft of, a, of an enormous level and a, a failure of love for humanity around me. I've also failed to love every customer that comes in after me and has to pay two cents more for a pack of gum. There is embedded in this sin selfish gain. 
It is a self-absorption, a, a self-worship. It is me at the center of everything, and I'm going to satisfy me. There are various idolatries. Maybe it's the idolatry of fresh breath. <laughs> I just can't go anywhere without it. Everybody hopes that I have a piece of gum rather than the rancid halitosis that I'm plagued with. And so maybe embedded in that is the esteem of others. I want others to think well of me. I want others to like me and be around me. And maybe it's the idolatry of comfort. And all of it is a worship of self. There is a failure here of trust in God's provision. Will God supply all my needs? He says so. Well, I don't want to believe his promise. I don't think he's providing for my eating right now. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. There is a failure here to work with my own hands. He who works shall not eat. Whether gum chewing is eating or not is probably biblically debatable. But you're not to be a mooch and you're not to be a thief. Work with your own hands. There's a failure of belief. E either the, the, the rank belief in God's existence. Uh, God isn't. God isn't. He doesn't exist. Or, or temporarily, I'm setting aside my theism for atheism. I'm going to act as if there is no God. There's no accountability for my actions. There's no one to please or displease. It's all about me. Uh, I'm just going to be worm food in the end. Or I'm going to live like that. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. It's the live for now type of atheism. Maybe I doubt God's goodness. He's not good enough to give me fresh breath at the moment. And maybe I doubt God's wisdom, his ability to act out his goodness. Boy, he's well-wishing. He's like a Santa Claus. He'd love for things to go well for me, but, but he doesn't know how to bring it about. So I'm just going to take care of this. Or maybe I doubt God's power to bring about what is good. In all of this, I, I concoct a resentment of God's operation of the universe. I'm willing to walk into a convenience store and transgress God's law and fail at love for all of humanity so that I can get what I want when I want it because God's not giving me what I want now. I'll take it for myself. This, this is a sin elevated to cosmic treason. It is a looking at God on his throne and saying, I do not like you. I do not like the way you're operating in the universe. I want to sit on that throne and I'm doing it right now via this pack of gum. Now, if I'd started with that sentence, you would have said that is absurd. But I hope you realize that that is the reality behind every sin. This is the reason that hell is justified. And this is the reason that only the cross work of Christ could rescue. We need to see sin this way. We can't stop at question one. We must get to question two. How does God feel about my sin? Well, God hates it. Again, he is holy, just, beautiful, infinitely good, and he must. And my sin here is an assault on his word. It's a transgression of his law. It's a libel on his character. Turn to Ephesians chapter five. Again, we want to put texts to how God feels about these things. Ephesians 5, three. God writes through the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians, sexual immorality, impurity, and greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints, nor filthiness, foolish talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no one sexually immoral or impure or greedy who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's pretty serious. That's a line in the sand from your maker. That those identified by these things, characterized by things, don't get to heaven. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3. Verses 5 and 6. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. You also walked 
in them. Now lay them aside. Revelation 22.15 tells us the list of those who will be excluded from the new heavens and the new earth. From the eternal heaven. All liars. All idolaters. The sexually immoral. Then look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. How does God feel about sin? He hates it. Sin will be punished unflinchingly forever. And we get ahead of ourselves a little bit here, but when you think about the cross work of Christ and the solution to sin, how did God feel about sin? Christ had to be left alone with that sin to receive the just punishment of an infinitely wrathful God against it. (laughs) The religions that humanity invents that aren't the cross work of Christ to satisfy God's anger against sin are such cheap, shoddy imitations and totally hopeless. This is why our our, our friends or family members or acquaintances who are in cults or isms of, of the various flavors of religion in the world can't answer the question, will you go to heaven when you die? Because they don't have the confidence. They can't have the confidence that only the cross of Christ produces. So let's look at question three. What did God do about my sin? What did God do about me lifting a pack of gum from the circle K? In love, he adopted me. In Christ, he forgave me. By grace, he saved me. How? How did he do this? Does God just sort of wink and and pretend it's all okay and let bygones be bygones? No, back to substitutionary atonement. He he had to actually satisfy his anger against my sin, my actual sins. And so I just bring to my memory substitutionary atonement verses. Make a list, write them out, memorize them. You're going to need them. But 2 Corinthians 5.21, insert name, insert sin. God made Jesus who knew no thieving, greedy, greedy, Covetous, loveless, selfish, idolatry, God's throne usurping cosmic treason. Jesus knew none of that. God made Jesus who knew none of that to become cosmic treason, lying, greed. So that Smedley might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. There's a danger when we think about these wonderful verses in the abstract rather than appropriating them personally. It was my sin that held him there, we sing. 1 Peter 3.18 Our sins are forgiven because Jesus, the just, went to the cross in the place of the unjust to pay for our sins. To bring us to God. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. My sins were the wounds that he carried. They were the sufferings that he bore to Calvary as a lamb silent before the slaughter. It was my transgressions he bore. John three sixteen, God loved me in this manner. That he crushed his son so that my faith (laughs) would guarantee not eternal destruction, but eternal life. 1 John 2, 2. God made Jesus to be a propitiation. God made Jesus to satisfy God's wrath against me. 
1 Timothy 1. Paul called himself the chief of sinners. You start working through this list and you're going to have an arm wrestling match with Paul over who's the chief. Who's at the front of the line? And the reality is any believer who who takes a, a good look at his own heart must come to the conclusion, I'm chief. Because we can see internally the the fruit, the branches, the trunk, the the roots, and the soil of our own lives far better than we can assess the outward behaviors of others. Doing this rightly makes you a humble person, makes you a better evangelist, makes you a good counselor. There's other things you need to know about what God did about your sin. Romans 6 makes it clear. He rescued you from slavery to that sin. You say, I'm not a slave. I'm not identified by that. I'm not characterized by that. I used to walk in them. Now I fight the residue. It's different. Your relationship to sin is different. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you're a new creation. Colossians 3, 1 to 3, you have a new identity, a new life, new power, new new desires. All of these things as grace gifts from God in the gospel. Question number four, what must I do about my sin? Turn back to Ephesians 4 with the specific sin in mind. Verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with those who are in need. Get a job, buy two packs of gum, give one to the clerk. (laughs) Rethink the whole thing about possessions and greed and idolatry. Have your mind renewed by the way God thinks. Live different. Put away theft and everything underneath it. Worship God only. Believe his promises and his warnings. Behave differently. Ephesians 4.25. Lay aside falsehood. Speak truth. When does a liar stop being a liar? When he stops talking? No, when he speaks truth out of a renewed mind and a soft heart. Colossians 3 gives the same pattern. What must I do about my sin? Remember the gospel. Put off bad behavior, motives, idolatries. Get rid of bad soil. Put on the right things. Make plans for turning. Again, repentance is a change of mind with concomitant behavior. Replacement of beliefs and loyalties, motives and actions. We begin by unpacking the sin and related sin. We trace the motives of the heart. We identify the idols of the heart. We discover unbelief in the heart. We trace God's definitions and descriptions. We remember God's holy character and his response. We remember and rehearse the gospel and we remove and replace. This template is something of a personal worksheet to help us do battle with sin. Answering these four questions writing out journal log entries and answers to these questions does not ensure repentance. I hope you understand. This is is a worksheet. (laughs) It is a platform for the endurance of faith and obedience. And this template really only addresses the vertical dimension, you and God. Uh, Next week, we'll talk about evidences of true repentance, which will involve the horizontal dimension with each other. If you have sinned against others, there is a horizontal dimension of confession, restitution if necessary, and reconciliation. And next week, we'll look at a template for evaluating our repentance. When you think about this template, these four questions here, does it seem like a lot of work? Perhaps it seems overwhelming. I would suggest to you that yes, it is a lot of work. And I want to I help you with some encouragement for a moment. It's a lot of work to dig through the Bible, find all of the relevant passages, soak in their importance, memorize substitutionary atonement verses, apply them to my situation, renew my mind. For me and the discovery of sin, I have a three-hour version of this uh, where I'm writing things down. I've got my Bible out and resources and I'm looking up passages and I'm applying them to a specific sin. And then there is also a three-minute version If I've done the three-hour version, I can do the three-minute version. Uh, There are times in the midst of conversation that there's a three-second version. God, this impatience in my heart that is boiling out into these words, you hate it, you paid for it, I must turn from it. There's a a short way to do this, but, but the long work 
fuels the ability to do the short work. So do the long work sometimes and employ the short version sometimes. You'll be a better counselor and a better friend. You'll be a better evangelist because this takes you back to the foot of the cross and the gospel and God's grace and a new identity and power all over again. I'm not suggesting that you sin to get the benefits. I am conceding that you will sin often, so get the benefits. Maybe this morning you're hung up on question one. Maybe you think about a sin category in your life and and you can't think of anything to write down. You don't know your heart well enough yet. You don't know your Bible well enough yet. Listen, you can phone a friend. Hey, I think I just said something that might be a sin. What do you think? You can read a good book on a specific subject. Drunkenness or addictive behaviors. You can read Ed Welch's book, Addictions, Banquet in the Grave. You struggle with anger, read Lou Priolo's book, Heart of Anger. If it's lust and sexual sin, read John Street's Passions of the Heart. If it's worry and anxiety, read Jerry Bridges' uh, Trusting God. If it's the fear of man, read Ed Welch's When People Are Big and God is Small. The best resource, of course, is your Bible. Even if you don't know where to turn, start flipping through the pages and look. There's a small concordance, most likely, in the back of your Bible where you can look up a topic like anger. And you'll get some verse references. Use that and and go look it up and and write them down. There are indexes for dealing with specific situations. Or you can get an exhaustive concordance that addresses every use of the word anger in the whole Bible. And you can start doing the big work. You can follow chain references to other passages in your Bible. You can fill a journal making lists of passages that deal with the sins you need to fight. And I would suggest the MacArthur Topical Bible, which lists things alphabetically by topic and then just gives you the text of Scripture right there under the topic. A really wonderful resource. But you might be hung up on question one in a different way. Not, I don't know what to write down, but I can't stop writing. I just can't seem to make it past the seemingly endless list of crimes and potential crimes out of the darkness of my own heart. I'll never make it to question three and the gospel. I filled a whole journal with question one and another journal about how much God hates what I wrote down in in question one. I'm too well acquainted with the inner workings of my own motives. I'm second guessing whether I've peered deeply enough into the abyss of my own residual depravity. I'm convinced even in my own confession list that I've been plagued by foul motives for confessing. If that's you, the deeply, morbidly introspective, there's another equipping hour coming. We'll get there. (laughs) For now, you must get to question three and question four. You must get to the gospel and you must get to the renew and replace. To have a right understanding of repentance, a right understanding of the gospel, a right understanding of the Christian life, it will not leave you short of the cross work of Christ. So get there. Bask there in the glory of what Jesus did. And then bask in the reality of life change that flows out of it. On the last screen here are some resources. Did the resources make it? Okay, good. Just take a picture of that. Um, You could add to this uh, Thomas Watson's book, The Doctrine of Repentance, or Kevin DeYoung's book, The Art of Turning. I'll put those up on the screen next week. Or Ted Crusoe's uh, the, The Duty of a clean conscience, duty and something. It's a Puritan. It's got a really long title. Duty and benefits of a clean conscience or something like that. Um, You can use these resources and books to help with that. I hope uh, what you've gotten this morning, just in these four questions here, is a bit of a template to, to ask your heart. What does God call my sin? How does he feel about it? What did he do about it for me? And then what must I do about it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for the gift of repentance. This is not something we could conjure up in our own strength. Uh, A love and loyalty to you that produces a hatred of sin uh, is not natural to us. It is supernatural. And yet it is part of the package that you give in a new heart. We thank you for that. And we also thank you for the day when we will no longer have to fight the residue. We praise you for that day and even ask, Lord Jesus, come quickly. It's in your name we pray. Amen.